everybody, and welcome to the, what is expected to be a really interesting afternoon with a glittering array of speakers. My name is Kate O'Regan. I'm the director of the Bonavera Institute of Human Rights. And those of you who are already tuned in um, via Zoom will know that this is a hybrid event, but I'm just reminding people in the audience here that it is a hybrid event. So bear with us a little bit with the technology. Uh, they are, we definitely find them the most difficult events to manage. Um, the topic of today is going to be a written constitution for the United Kingdom, and in many ways it's, a, it's a engage, an engagement to discuss a paper that Jeff King wrote as his inaugural lecture last year, just, I think, before uh, the pandemic began, and sparked a lot of conversation here and elsewhere, and we're really delighted, Jeff, to have you here this afternoon to be able to have a much fuller engagement, I think, with the extraordinary and uh, thoughtful ideas that you put forward in that paper. So the program is going to be that we'll start with Jeff speaking for roughly 10 minutes. Then the first panel uh, will um, be comprised of Professor Nick Barber, Professor Chris McCrudden, and Professor A.C. Grayling, who I'll introduce in a moment. And that will run from about quarter past two till quarter to four, when we will have a tea break outside for those of us who are here. And then we'll restart again at five past four and have another panel, this time with Joanna Cherry, Carwin Jones, and uh, Hannah White, and um, that will run until um, 25 to 6, and then we'll have uh, some concluding remarks, and then there will be a small wine reception outside for those of us who are here. So once again, a very warm welcome. I'm going to just very briefly introduce Jeff King, and then before the panel begins, I'll introduce the members of the first panel, and then the th second panel just before it begins. So probably Jeff needs little introduction to those of you who are here. He's a professor of law at University College London. He's also a visiting professor here in Oxford. Um, he has recently finished serving a period of time as legal advisor to the House of Lords Constitutional Committee, um, and he is currently engaged on an enormous project, um, engaging in research on comparative responses to COVID-19 particularly, I think, from a constitutional perspective, which I think is going to give us an, a, a huge uh, empirical database for thinking about comparative constitutional law and structures of government and crisis uh, for years to come. So I'm sure that there are times when Jeff wakes up and thinks, why did I do this? Because it is such a big job. But I think for those of us who are comparative constitutional lawyers and interested in comparative politics and government, it's going to be a resource for which we're going to thank you many mornings for many years to come. Without further ado, then, I'm going to introduce you to Jeff King. Thank you very much, Kate, and, um, and thank you for all of the people that have come to comment on my paper today. I really can't thank, thank uh, Dr. Stefan Teil or my host, Professor Cato Regan, enough for giving me the opportunity to revisit the arguments that are in my essay on a written constitution. And more importantly, for putting together such an extraordinary group of commentators to discuss it. People watching or listening or here today will not only learn a lot, but be dazzled by the intellectual firepower and learning on show. Let me begin by outlining the very argument under discussion today. Why is it a democratic case for a written constitution? I distinguish that argument from two other common arguments for a written constitution the clarity argument, and the rights argument. The clarity argument maintains that without a written constitution, we just don't know what the rules are that we live under. Key matters are unclear. Now, this is an argument that's been put by distinguished commentators, Professor Vernon Bogdanor, Robert Blackburn, and others. Now, I think that a written constitution would be clear on some key fundamentals, but it's not my main argument. Basically, there's a lot that is already known, there's a lot left unsettled by a written constitution. And most importantly, the argument doesn't really address the potential downsides of written constitutionalism. Perhaps that was in the way that the democratic case does. The second argument I distinguish it from is the rights argument. And it runs as follows. Our rights won't be secured unless we have an entrenched bill of rights enforced by judges that will protect us from legislative overreach. Now, the limits of this argument, as I show in the article, is that there is really not a strong empirical link between robust judicial enforcement and real political protection of rights. 
For example, indexes show that most of the top performance performers in rights protection don't actually have robust and entrenched judicial review of rights. And furthermore, we have a statutory bill of rights in the UK in the Human Rights Act of 1998. It's true that it's under siege at the moment, but even if we assume that it comes out of that debacle, that political contest, perhaps a little bit scathed, the, the rights case is quite equivocal. Neither does the argument, the rights argument, address the intricacies of just how entrenched the rights should be. Deep, deep entrenchment could promote political backlash, packing courts with reactionary judges who may in turn block or read down important legislation. Admittedly, that doesn't happen everywhere. It certainly could happen here. That the democratic case breaks from these types of tendencies. It defends a democratic character of a certain kind of constitutionalism. And by democratic, I mean a pluralist, deliberative, and rights-respecting kind of democracy. I wholly reject the Schumpeterian conception that treats anything done by the state between periodic elections as democratic. More specifically, the democratic case is this. The people, through its representatives and on occasion directly, should have a say in the most fundamental rules that they live under and how those rules are changed. That voice has to be proactive in the drafting process. And that's where the metaphor of authorship that I developed in the paper comes from. They should not just be acquiescent in an existing status quo, accepting the rules that are handed down through history, nor should they even simply ratify a program that's been designed by others. They must play a role in designing the rules. Now, my claim is that under the current UK system, the people have had no direct say on the vast majority of what those fundamental rules are. And their indirect say, through political representatives in Westminster, is marred completely by the structure of that institution. At any given time, it's dominated by one party that rarely has more than 40% of the popular vote behind it. The opportunity to change the fundamental rules is, with few exceptions, put on the, not put on the table as an option. Now, you might say, and I think Nick will say, nonsense. The People's Parties run the show in Westminster. They can change the Constitution whenever they want, and sometimes they change bits of it, and in the early 1990s, the Labour Party changed a whole lot of it. The sad fact for your argument, Jeff, this argument runs, is that neither main party has an appetite for a written constitution, and that's an affirmative choice, chosen by the people, you might say. Well, is it? Why not put that very question of whether we should have a written constitution adopted by an independent constitutional convention to a referendum? If you put that proposition to a senior member of either major party, I think you'll see knees tremble or peremptory dismissal along with backpedaling to a very different kind of argument. One that's not about whether the people want it, but rather about whether it makes sense to ask them. The real reason, in my view, there's no appetite in either major party is that the two most powerful political parties trade in absolute power and have a very strong interest in maintaining that status quo. The absolute power model is this. You win an election, you do what you want. Any exercise in codification is either going to confirm or reduce that power. It couldn't expand on it. So no wonder neither party has an appetite for it. And small wonder, furthermore, that the Labour Party gets interested in major and bold constitutional reform when it smarts most from its time-honoured time tradition of losing national elections. Of course, when it does decide that reform is required, it creates and delivers the solutions by itself. In any case, the lack of appetite is not an argument. It's a statement of real politique. Now, that's the democratic case. What implications does it have for how the Constitution's actually written? I need to say something about that. And I want to outline the kind of assembly that I have in mind very quickly, because to, to give all the supporting arguments would take far too long. First, you need to have a constituent assembly, that is a constitutional convention that is independent of parliament. And this does not follow from some conception of constituent power and how it's exercised. I reject that metaphysics of peoplehood. Rather, the assembly is functionally engineered for the activity of representation for writing a constitution. In a legislative assembly like the UK Parliament, selected on a winner-takes-all electoral system, is, it is manifestly ill-suited for this kind of constitution writing exercise. Second, the composition of the assembly should be, in my contention, two-thirds elected and one-third appointed 
from amongst the public. The elected portion would be composed by party candidates elected on a closed list PR system so the parties could put forth their best constitutional um, uh, personnel. Now, why parties and why two-thirds? Party members possess the political understanding and experience to understand how politics works, how the sausages are made, and how territorial politics works as well. They will also give a sense of what will be viable and supportable from within the parties when the new rules come into force, and they're essential for that and for the referendum campaign that follows. The two-thirds figure is chosen so that no party or faction has overall control of the chamber. Coalitions will be needed. That's healthy constitution building. The one-third representation would be appointed by sortition, which is roughly like the way that juries are appointed, randomly selected amongst the electorate. They would need to agree to take on the big burden that would come with it. This body would be more descriptively representative and less beholden to, whipped, uh, to, the, to the whips of the parties. Thirdly, this formula of two-thirds, one-third would need to be adjusted to ensure representativity for distinct sub-communities or for what we might call the politics of difference. I would envisage quotas to be at work here, essentially, to ensure that matters including gender, race, economic status, region, sexual orientation, religious affiliation, and of course, national identity to be taken into account in the composition of the assembly. Namely, you need the numbers there so that the voices are adequate to be heard. I'm sure there will be lots said today about the role of devolved governments and parliaments and of the, de of the issues of this multinational democracy, and I'll keep my further thoughts on this for my response. Fourth, the whole of this would be staffed by a well-resourced and nonpartisan secretariat, ideally headed by a suitable senior former civil servant, such as a cabinet secretary. The appointment would ideally be confirmed by resolutions of the four UK legislatures. That person would ensure that expertise in nonpartisan briefings are consistently available to the members of the assembly, and they would run the elaborate consultation exercises, which would include citizens' assemblies and other um, mini-publics in various parts of the country. Fifth and lastly, the product of this assembly should be put up for a referendum and not be adopted unless upheld and that referendum supported. So the people have had their say. Let me just say a couple of words about how we can ensure that that say would endure over time. How can we ensure that the Constitution doesn't become the dead hand of the past? Two ways, essentially. First, the Constitution, in my argument, should be flexible. Major change should be affected by a constitutional amendment bill passed by both houses and later put to a national referendum. A different procedure would apply to more minor changes, and a more legislatively guided co-decision procedure would presumably apply for changes to the territorial constitution. We can say more about that later. The main device is that majoritarian constraints only would apply. Second, the Constitution would expire after something between 20 and 25 years, and a new constitutional convention would automatically be convened. This is the requirement of what I call generational constitutional renewal. This excites some people the most. Some think it's daft. Some think it's naive. Many think it's both. I don't see why. The reason that it's on the table for discussion is clear, I think. The force of the legitimating democratic say tends to erode over time, and I think that there's a need to refresh the nexus between democratic input and constitutional framework if we're to continue to fly the banner of democratic legitimation for the constitutional arrangements we have. There's much to be said about that, but I'm sure it will come out in discussion. So let me conclude by summarizing the argument that uh, is on the table today. The argument is this. The people should have a proactive authorial, that's a metaphor, okay, but I'm, I would defend the metaphor and I do in the article, authorial say through their representatives and through a referendum on the fundamental rules they live under, that that, secondly, that that democratic case requires an inclusive drafting procedure conducted outside of parliament with direct citizen participation as well as party involvement, and lastly, the constitution should be flexible and it should be renewed every generation. That's the democratic case for the written constitution. Thank you very much for listening.
Well, thanks very much, Jeff, for a characteristically clear and concise account of, what, uh, of the longer lecture. Uh, we're now going to move to our first panel. And as has, Jeff has indicated, one of the things in putting together this panel that Dr. Tile, who did nearly all the work for it, was very keen to do, was to make sure that the constituent nations of the United Kingdom would be here today. And we are really delighted that we do, across the two panels, have people from all four parts of the UK. So on our first panel, and I'm going to do it in order of speaking, which may, I have to say, come as something of a surprise to the panelists, so if they could just take note. Uh, the first panelist I'm going to introduce is Anthony Grayling, who needs very little um, introduction. Uh, he is the founder of the New College of Humanities at Northeastern University in uh, the United States. He's a supernumerary fellow here at St. Anne's College in Oxford. He's a, a leading British um, political uh, thinker and has written many books uh, in the field of democracy, philosophy, and politics. We're really de delighted to have you with us this afternoon, Anthony. Um, and then the next speaker um, will be Professor Christopher McCrudden. Um, Chris McCrudden um, also needs relatively little introduction to an Oxford audience. Um, he's now Professor of Human Rights at Queen's University, Belfast, and the William W. Cook Global Professor uh, at University of Michigan in the United States. But in a former life, he was the Professor of Human Rights here at Oxford until 2011. It's great to see you again, Chris. Thanks very much for joining us today. And finally, also needs no introduction to this audience, is Professor Nick Barber, Professor of Constitutional Law here at the University of Oxford, a fellow of Trinity, um, and a, a sort of leading writer on constitutional law issues. Uh, two of the three-part trilogy have been published, The Constitutional State and Principles of Constitutionalism. Thanks again for being here, Nick. I think the other way in which the members of the panel were selected was a sort of core principle of the Bonavera Institute is that we, we don't want a chorus this afternoon. We want some constructive disagreement. Uh, and I've said that not just because I've just mentioned Nick Barber's name, but um, we're sure we're going to get a lot of constructive disagreement, and that is really what makes us think best. So, uh, Anthony, over to you. Uh, 10 to 15 minutes for each of the panellists, followed by a response from Jeff, followed open, it'll be open to Q&A, both for people online and for people who are here. Thanks, Anthony. Anthony, we can't hear you. Hang on a moment. I'm just going to have to ask for guidance from the tech people. No, that was my fault. I was um, muted. You were muted. Okay. Well, uh, I, I, please I sorry. Immediately it was mine. Okay, good. Off you go. Right, well, I, I just repeat uh, my, my thanks to, uh, to the Bonneville Institute and to Jeff for a very good introduction. Um, I very much welcome Jeff's initiative here because it has got us thinking and, and discussing, which is a, a great thing. And I find much to agree with in um, Jeff's paper. In particular, I think the suggestions that he makes about the mechanism for setting up a constitution have a great deal to recommend themselves. Um, I suppose just one small uh, reservation might be that putting the uh, constitution thus drafted to a referendum um, is very optimistic as to just how close a reading the constitution document would get from the general public. Referendums on the whole ask for a binary answer to a, a simple question, and this, of course, is a difficult matter. But I agree that uh, if the constitution is going to be a genuinely democratic one, then as much public involvement as possible is desirable. I should mention also that a, a very good entailment of the idea of a democratic constitution is that a one that is properly authorized and in uh, Jeff's uh, uh, metaphor written um, by, the, by, by the people of the country, is that it continues to exist and exercise this democratic function between elections. Jeff is quite right that our problem, or one of our numerous problems in the UK, is that uh, between elections we have one-party rule, uh, and uh, when the party in question is not one um, that uh, is distinguished by its responsibility or its inclusiveness, uh, then, of course, uh, difficulties arise. So the existence of a constitution operating between elections continues to exert that kind of democratic oversight. So that's very good. The points that, that uh, I wanted to raise are these. 
And one can distinguish between questions of principle about why a constitution is a good thing and uh, practical questions about how it's written, uh, how it operates, how it's reviewed and renewed when time comes. And it's very hard to decouple the question of principle from the question of practice because most objections to uh, arguments in favor of a constitution tend to be practical objections about, for example, the rigidity and inflexibility uh, of, of a constitution, um, citing, for example, the case of the um, American uh, US Constitution, Second Amendment, which when it was adopted in 1791, giving a right to bear arms ambiguously as to whether it's uh, malicious or individuals, but at any rate, a right to bear arms when the arms in question were muzzle-loading muskets with which it would be very hard to commit a, a massacre in a, in a school. Uh, and its uh, inflexibility has resulted in the uh, political obstruction to so modifying matters in the Constitution that uh, now that muzzle-loading muskets have evolved into AR-15 automatic assault weapons, a problem has been generated by the Constitution a rod has been made for the U.S. is back by it. And so this kind of objection to a written constitution is a very common one. And my argument is that on the question of principle, um, and I take what uh, uh, Jeff describes as a, a clarity-based uh, uh, argument, which I think is, is in, in fact, uh, much the same, in fact, as the words favor, they run together, is this. In wanting clarity and consistency in uh, the institutions of governance and in uh, what they exist to perform their purposes and what the duties are of office holders in those institutions and what the limits on their powers are and what redress uh, people have against um, uh, poor functioning or abuse of those powers uh, and the uh, failure of those institutions to meet their purposes. In, in doing this, in having a, a, a specification of these issues, we get what we want from a constitution, which is clarity and consistency. We know what the institutions are for, we know what people should be doing in them, we um, know how to get redress when they don't work, and we know what the limits on powers are, which is tremendously important. And in particular, these uh, provisions ought also to specify, and specification is important here, what the rights of individuals are in the society. Knowing your rights, I mean, the, you know, the, whenever you watch a detective uh, um, series on television and somebody's arrested, they have their rights read to them, and there is an extremely important reason why that should be so. But generalizing from that to a good, clear conception of what everybody's rights and their correlative duties are in society, and what the redress is when they're abused is uh, essential to their functioning, to their effective functioning in the society. So the clarity argument of principle, why we would want a written constitution at all, seems to me to be unanswerable. I mean, surely we um, need to know, uh, and I'm conscious of the fact that whenever one uses the word surely, one is signaling a, a, you know, an appeal to, to people's rationality. Um, but, but surely uh, it should be uh, matter of um, uh, really no discussion, no need for discussion, but we want to know what our institutions and office holders are up to, what they should be doing, uh, and how to monitor uh, their activities. There should be you know, opportunities for audit and review at every stage of uh, the practices of governments. <clears throat> now, of course, the practical questions arise in connection with the nature of the Constitution, how it's written, what its contents are, how it's reviewed, and how it's renewed. And the question uh, central to that, of course, is the question of the degree of flexibility of the Constitution. On the one hand, you don't want its provisions to be such that they are vulnerable to political fashion or whim or uh, moral panics in society. You want a mature-minded, methodical means of ensuring that the Constitution is always apt for conditions in society. Uh, and you want it to be a genuinely democratic review process, much along the lines that uh, Jeff has suggested. And it seems to me that this practical question is not out with the uh, possibility of uh, human intelligence to find ways of drafting um, both the uh, constitutional provisions themselves and in devising the mechanisms for reviewing and renewing them 
which is such that the constitution would be kept fresh and, and flexible. The idea of a periodic uh, um, major review is a good one, uh, but I think leaving a constitution in place for 25 years without the possibility of some uh, adaptation and review in the interim might itself be problematic. So perhaps something which is a, a little bit more uh, current might be a value there. But it cannot be, it, it cannot be an insuperable objection to the principal case for having a, a codified constitution. I understand why Jeff has used the phrase written constitution there because of the metaphor of the authorial uh, um, in intervention of the people. But of course, we have a constitution, it's just uncodified, it's a, a spatchcock affair, it's a, a lots of chewing gum and, and uh, elastoplast at the moment. And codifying it, organizing it, introducing into the, uh, into the chaos and variability of our uh, governance arrangements in this country is what the point of having a constitution down on paper would be. But uh, to conclude, um, I very much uh, agree that it should be uh, democratic. One point to make about that, the concept of something's being democratic is that if any organ uh, of, of government uh, is licensed and controlled by the democratically elected uh, body or bodies in uh, the um, state, then they are ipso facto democratic. Uh, being democratic is a transitive property, uh, which is why, <clears throat> uh, this is a separate argument, it could be argued that the current House of Lords uh, despite being an unelected body, um, the problem with it is the way it is appointed, not so much the fact that it is appointed, but arguably speaking, the, even the current House of Commons, uh, House of Lords, is a democratic body. It could equally be argued that the Senate, the United States Senate, is not a democratic body because it is so uh, wildly unrepresentative uh, of uh, population terms. So. This idea of something's being democratic, very, very important idea, very important that it should seriously involve uh, the um, participation and consent of the people. And therefore, what Jeff has to say about how a constitution might be written, might be written down, and what, needs, uh, what it needs in the way of input is, in my view, on the whole, uh, very agreeable. Thanks very much, Anthony. And now I'm going to turn to Chris. Chris, can you just make sure you unmute yourself? Uh, Kate, you're muted. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I think somebody's unmuting me up there and muting me down here. Anyway, um, sorry. Thanks very much, Anthony. And uh, Chris, if you could make sure you unmute yourself, and I'll do the same. Thanks very much. Uh, can you hear me OK? Uh, yes. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, yes, Great. we can. Thank you. Um, thanks, Kate, and, and um, thanks to Bonavera for the for the invitation. Um, so, in in the short time available, um, I, I want to focus on on two issues, if I may. Um, first, when Jeff implicitly adopts a, a "we the people" approach, um, who are the people that he's referring to? And and second, what approach does Jeff take to the issue of sovereignty? And I'll be somewhat critical on both these issues. So let me make it clear that I am, in fact, uh, a supporter of written constitutions uh, as a matter of principle. My, my focus is particularly on parts three and four of the article, although I think it has implications um, for the earlier part of the article as, as well. So the issue of who the people consists of is, is not just some technical question, but I think one that goes to the heart of the idea of consent. Um, so, um, Jeff quoted Sir Ivor Jennings, um, and, and I'll do that as well. So, um, Ivor Jennings, I think, was correct when he said that the apparently sensible rallying call of let the people decide was problematic, uh, quotes, because the people cannot decide until someone decides who are the people. In, in practical terms, then, the, the theoretically loaded term of the people which is, I think, at the heart of um, Jeff's article, uh, requires some interrogation. So my, my claim as to the centrality of the concept of, of the people to his article needs, I think, to be substantiated. His, his broad claim in the article, um, and indeed in what he's just said uh, today, is to make what he calls a democratic case for a written constitution. And, and he writes on page 25, 
Clearly, if the case for a written constitution is largely democratic, the participation by the people in the end product is essential, unquote. And then his, his advocacy of a constituent assembly to draft a new constitution requires, he said, quotes, that it must represent the people. Um, and in defense of, of his claim that there's support for constitutional change, he cites various opinion polls, which he, show, which, which he says show that the people want these changes. So what exactly then is Jeff's understanding of the people here? Well, there seems to be an overlap with citizenship to begin with. So on page two, he refers to the right of citizens to participate in the writing of the fundamental law. Um, and in his discussion of the makeup of the constituent assembly, he clarifies that his references to the people, quotes, don't seek to essentialize the idea. I simply mean the citizenry and electors, perhaps residents. And that's on page 27. And then further on, in, in describing the additional non-party members who would be included in, in the assembly, the constituent assembly, he refers to the need for, quote, a substantial body of non-party citizens. Okay, so how exactly then, to cut to the chase, does Northern Ireland fit into all of this? Now, I, I realize that the topic um, of Northern Ireland is one that can clear a room in London or in Oxford in about 60 seconds flat, um, such is the usual boredom that it engenders. Uh, I'm reminded of the, the old joke that's told about an Irish doctor visiting London for the first time and being invited to a, a dinner party. Some of you will know this story. So he feels terribly left out until the conversation turns to the issue of suicide. And he feels suddenly that this at least is a subject that he can con contribute to. So he pipes up for the first time and he tells the assembled guests who'd largely forgotten he was there that Ireland has in fact the lowest suicide rate in Europe. Pity, says his host. So I realize that most of those participating in the call today will probably want to quietly forget Northern Ireland in this debate. But in doing so, I suggest that would be a mistake, um, however embarrassing it is to have to consider it. And this is because introducing Northern Ireland into the equation, and also Scotland, I guess, but Joanna Cherry will speak to that, requires constitutional reformers in England to up their game as to what such reform is actually aiming to achieve. And with that, who should decide the contours of any new written constitution? So there are some, you know, some indications in the article that Jeff some, some, simply doesn't get the subtleties of Northern Ireland. Uh, rather unfairly, I suppose, I, I checked which regions the opinion posters he cites uh, actually surveyed. So he cites several opinion polls at the beginning. Who, who did they actually ask? And in none of the polls was there any attempt to survey opinion in Northern Ireland. Slightly awkward. And he later describes the UK Parliament, and this is on page 26, as, quotes, the nation's best conduit for political dialogue, decision, and scrutiny. Really? Well, not if you've ever tried to get the dialogue um, or the conversation or the decision to take Northern Ireland seriously. Uh, note, by the way, the casual reference to the nation. So he says, the nation's best conduit. So I'll return to that uh, in a moment. And there is consistently the casual conflation of the United Kingdom and Britain throughout the article. But, but that's sort of superficial. More importantly, there's also no explicit mention of the most important constitutional event to occur in Northern Ireland, indeed on the island of Ireland since partition, namely the Belfast Good Friday Agreement in 1993, sorry, 1998. Instead, the peace process on the island of Ireland is described almost entirely through the lens of the devolution settlement, as he calls it. Although there's a passing reference to, quotes, a broader package. So whether intentional or not, ignoring the agreement, which is, of course, an international treaty binding in international law, 
allows him to ignore the, its implications for his proposals, which I think are quite significant. The issue that that agreement presents is how constitutional change can and should occur in a polity where a significant proportion of the population does not consider itself part of the nation. And the genius of the agreement was to recognize that the only way of doing so, of handling that situation, was by setting the issue of Northern Ireland in the broader European and island of Ireland contexts. So the union, the notion of the union, the boundaries of the state, what the nation consisted in, who the people are, were all put into contention and remain so. We simply cannot go back to the pre-agreement assumption that the boundaries of the state are fixed, that the people who can decide the constitutional future of Northern Ireland are the people of the UK as a whole, or that the people of Ireland are not included as legitimate and active participants in any such moves. So it's noteworthy that those who can vote in any referendum on whether Northern Ireland leaves the UK, for example, and joins Ireland is restricted to the people of Northern Ireland. So the UK does not get to vote. And that Ireland, in, contrary, in contrast, must consent to the change. So why the, the apparent blindness on Jeff's part? And I suspect that Jeff is ultimately at heart a small U unionist who defines the nation in UK terms. So he refers on page 19 to the weak state of the union, quotes, as something between an embarrassment and a travesty, unquote. Really? For whom is it the weak state, an embarrassment and a travesty? There's no mention as to what, quotes, the nation consists in. But the fact that Scottish and Welsh nationalism is discussed entirely in terms of devolution gives a strong hint. There's no indication, for example, that there would need to be, although he says it today, I have to say, I didn't at least notice it in the, in the draft of the article, that there would need to be separate affirmative votes in each of the four nations before any new constitution that Jeff envisages could come into force. Does that mean a veto? So there's a joke about the Lone Ranger and Tonto, those of you who ever watched the Lone Ranger when you were young, I'm afraid I did. And you remember Tonto uh, is his American Indian sidekick. And the joke is that the Lone Ranger and Tonto are caught by a troop of Indians, as we called them in my childhood. And they crouch behind a rock and the Lone Ranger turns to Tonto and looking worried says to him, well, it looks like we're done for Tonto. And Tonto responds, what do you mean we, white man? So I'm simply not prepared to sign off on a proposal that, will, that would allow Jeff's people to decide my people's constitutional future. Sorry. But there's a broader problem still, and this brings me to my second issue, which is the question of sovereignty. So here I'm not referring to the idea of parliamentary sovereignty, which, which is considered, but to the question of whether uh, there is to be a sovereign, uh, who that is, and what are the implications. So my friend and colleague at the University of, of, of Michigan, um, the political theorist Don Herzog, has argued that the classic theory of sovereignty, um, and here I'm quoting quotes, holds that every political community must have a single locus of authority, and turning to, now to the extent of the authority, that that authority must be unlimited, undivided, and unaccountable to any higher authority. So adopt, adopting that concept of sovereignty then, popular sovereignty would require that the people are the source and ultimate locus of, of political authority, and that the authority of, quotes, the people must be unlimited, undivided, and unaccountable. And that seems a pretty good summary of Jeff's understanding of the role of his enactment process. Let's call it a sovereigntist understanding. There appears to be no substantive constraints on what the Constitutional Convention may adopt. In particular, international law and international institutions doesn't appear as a constraint, which brings us back, partly at least, to the issue of the Good Friday Agreement as a binding constitutional text and international legal text. By the way, the fact that his approach is sequentially sovereigntist, that is, different bodies become sovereign at particular 
um, uh, periods doesn't make it any less sovereigntist in orientation. As Herzog argues, however, most political systems place such limits on sovereignty that we now have, at best, a hollowed out concept of sovereignty. And this goes well beyond issues of entrenchment and the amendment formula. The prevalence of concepts such as federalism, the rule of law, constitutional and, and human rights have meant that few, if any, sovereigns exercise unlimited, undivided or unaccountable authority, and a good thing too. Sovereignty, including popular sovereignty, has been tamed, Herzog argues, by constitutionalism. And in a globalized world, it might safely be relegated to the place where previously important but now outdated concepts go to die, and I agree. So rather than Jeff's argument of we the people being an expression of constitutionalism, as he claims, it seems to me to be its antithesis. So in conclusion, at least depending on how you define constitutionalism. So in conclusion, and, and with regret, I simply disagree with Jeff's claim that his case for a written constitution does in fact relate to quote what he calls the profound political challenges presently faced by the United Kingdom. At least it doesn't do that if those challenges are defined to include, as I think they must, the issue of the union and the issue of sovereignty. Indeed, I'm tempted to go further and suggest that Jeff's article is part of the problem rather than offering a solution. Well, Kate, you did invite me to be controversial. I hope I haven't disappointed. disappointed. Not at all. Thanks, Chris. And I, thanks, Chris. That was great. Um, now we're going to turn to Nick Barber, who I'm sure is also not going to disappoint in that regard. I'll leave it off you. Well, good, good afternoon, um, everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm often invited to uh, speak at the Bonavero. The Bonavero stands for Human Rights, Liberty and Good Governance. And uh, Kate invites me to give something of a contrast, I think, to the papers presented. Uh, Jeff's paper, um, arguing for a written constitution for the United Kingdom, is rich and subtle. I'm only going to address two of the claims that he makes uh, in the paper. First, that there should be a new written constitution every 20 years or so. It's a bit like that, the, the opening bit in Mission Impossible where the tape uh, self-destructs. So every 20 years or so, whether the people want it to or not, Jeff's constitutions uh, self-destruct. Could call it Mission Impossible constitutionalism. And secondly, that we should create a written constitution for the United Kingdom today, right now. Um, at the end of this brief talk, I will give you some thoughts about when I think we would need to create a written constitution, but I'm not sure today is the, 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 the right moment. First, a thought experiment. It's audience participation time in the seminar. So prepare yourself. Imagine all the states that have existed in history. Conjure them up before you. I don't really care when you think the form of the state started, but line them all up. Now imagine the lifespan of each of these states chopped into 40-year periods. So you've got all the states, you cut them up into 40-year chunks. Here's the experiment, ladies and gentlemen. You, can rank, you should now rank these chunks in order of attractiveness, from the best places to live to the worst. So I want you to rank those chunks. And while you're doing the ranking, you don't know your sex, your race, your health, your wealth, or anything about yourself at all. So it's completely random which body you're going to be born into, into those states. So don't rank George and England uh, at the top on the basis you want to live in a Jane Austen novel. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, Jeff, crinolines are out for you. Um, here's the payoff to this thought experiment. You can open your eyes now. Where have you ranked the United Kingdom today? Where have you ranked this state right now? Well. It might not be at the top, but I think that if you're honest and if you've given this a good go, then it's probably in the top 1% or 2%. And I would recommend this thought experiment to anyone tempted by radical 
constitutional reform. By just about any criteria you choose to use, the United Kingdom in 2020 is a stunning success. By any criteria you choose to use, it's a stunning success. I heard hissing, like a pantomime from down the front. Remember the thought experiment. It, <laughs> it was all states at all times going right back to ancient Mesopotamia. All states divided into 40-year chunks. By that criteria, I think the United Kingdom is doing fantastically well. Um, and if we're judging the United Kingdom constitution, its truest test is by the state that it has created. However odd the United Kingdom may look, however messy it may look to those of a tidy disposition, however annoying its vagaries and compromises, it has produced a successful and well-functioning state. Now, if I may pause here for a second before the constitutional reformers leap forward and take the stage, a couple of notes about our thought experiment. Firstly, a causal point. I'm not arguing the United Kingdom constitution is solely responsible for the success of the United Kingdom such as it is. But I am arguing that it is either partly responsible or at the very least it hasn't got in the way of the United Kingdom's success. And if either of those are, 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 are true, those are strong arguments for valuing the constitution we've got. Second, I am not arguing the United Kingdom is perfect or nor even that the United Kingdom is the best state open to us. There may have been states that you ranked higher. You might want to live in Sweden in the 1980s or Canada in the 1960s. It's just that we've done really well. And finally, I'm not arguing the United Kingdom cannot be improved. This isn't a global argument against constitutional reform. Um, there's plenty for us to um, reform and improve about the United Kingdom, even if we think that it's done really rather well. But what the thought experiment does show, I think, is that ripping up the United Kingdom's constitution and starting afresh would probably be a mistake. Now, in his work, Jeff identifies one of the purposes of constitutions as being a mission statement. A mission statement is the phrase, phrase he uses. So the constitution provides an opportunity to define the objectives of the state, its aspirations, where it wants to go. And this ties in with Jeff's claim that the constitution should then be renegotiated every 20 years or so, that the two are tied together. Because on Jeff's account, each generation should set its own mission statement, should have a chance to articulate its own mission statement about where the state should go. This is the democratic argument for written constitution that Jeff is running. Jeff's right that constitutions can play this role, or do often play this role. They often contain statements of aspiration about where the state should go. But it is not the primary purpose of a constitution. The primary purpose of a constitution is to create a stable and an effective state, one which can and does support the well-being of its people. The narrower mission statements of particular constitutions and the value of expressing these in a document should be regarded as nesting within this overarching purpose. So Jeff has picked one of the things constitutions can do, but it's a thing that should be located within the broader objective of creating a successful uh, uh, and effective state. Jeff's proposal for regular constitutional rewrites, I put to you, would unsettle the United Kingdom constitution, throwing open its operation uh, uh, into the air, unsettling compromises, and that sometimes reluctant but essential acquiescence on which states, uh, successful states depend. And even if Jeff's constitutional convention only occurred every 20 years or so, we would have uh, uh, instability in the five or six years running up to the convention. We would have another period of instability in the five or six years after the constitution, as Jeff's new constitution embedded. Now, Professor Grayling said the objections to um, this constitution uh, reform process were pragmatic. I'm not sure that this is a pragmatic objection. This is a principled objection based on what you should want a constitution should do to do. To put this into perspective, ask yourself about the attractions of opening up some of the tricky questions of the United Kingdom Constitution every 20 years. And Chris McCrudden stole the next paragraph. 
Chris McCrudden knows far more about Northern Ireland uh, than I do, but I do seem to remember, Chris, the Good Friday Agreement was quite tricky to negotiate. It wasn't easy, was it? Um, do we really want to see the Good Friday Agreement ripped up every 20 years or so and renegotiated? Though, of course, on Jeff's model, the renegotiation would probably be easier than the first time round because it would be largely conducted by the English. Because however Jeff's convention is organised, those from Northern Ireland would be in a tiny minority in that convention. It would certainly make things a lot quicker. I'm not sure it's necessarily, though, what we would uh, uh, want to see. Um, by the way, I would like to also endorse very strongly Chris's point about the shameful lack of concern that English constitutional scholars, and I use the word English deliberately, have paid to Northern Ireland. It's really quite scandalous the way in which constitutional law textbooks and uh, 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 monographs put Northern Ireland off to one side and pretend it doesn't exist. I actually think that a very good uh, book, and perhaps one day, Chris, you'll write it, could be written about the United Kingdom constitution entirely from the perspective of Northern Ireland. I think that would be extremely uh, revealing. Um, it's worth noting, and I heard for the first time today, Jeff's suggestion that the constituent territories of the United Kingdom might be given a veto on the resulting uh, constitution. I, I don't know if that's... No? no I misheard. OK, so I'll, I'll pass on. These thoughts slide into my second area of objections, of objections to Jeff's proposal. The claim we should produce a written constitution today, right now, uh, 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 this very day. Well, consider, if you will, who would get to write this written constitution? It would be Boris's, jo Boris Johnson's government in the driving seat. I would bet it would be Michael Gove taking the lead, and I would bet Policy Exchange would be the think tank on speed dial engaging in the process. You would almost certainly end up with a very different sort of constitution to the one that would have been produced by Lord Irvin with a constitution unit lending a helping hand. Now, Jeff might say to you that he's given us a mechanism that would take the drafting of that constitution out of the hands of the government. But I doubt that even Jeff would have that much control over the process that is adopted. If you support a written constitution to be produced today, you're very likely to get a Johnsonian constitution as a product. And what an intriguing vision that is. <laughs> and I might add, even if this is not the case, even if Jeff's plans were adopted wholesale, we might still wonder what the outcome would be. Would devolution be retained? Remember, the vast majority of people engaged in Jeff's constitutional convention will be English and perhaps fed up with the, 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 the devolved regions. Would we disaffiliate from the European Convention on Human Rights? Quite possibly. Would the, would the Human Rights Act itself get the push? It might. I'm not sure how popular it is with the population as a whole. Remember, this was a country that voted for Brexit a few years ago and which still seems to think that that was a good idea, which shows where we are, I suppose. But you might reply, if the people want a Johnsonian constitution, they should get it, good and hard. Jeff's work on constitutions and mission statements does not discriminate between left and right-wing objectives for the state. Perhaps we should welcome the opportunity to see Boris's vision of the nation manifest in legal form for the next 20 years. But going back to my earlier discussion of the point of constitutions, there is value in inconsistency. There is value in uncertainty. There is value in allowing multiple visions of constitutions to coexist in the same location. This is an anathema to Jeff's rationalist approach to constitutions, where the document should be clear and coherent, but I think it is a, 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 a good thing, a powerful asset, that those drawn to the new Labour constitutional project of the 1990s can see elements of it in the constitutional order, just as Brexiteers can now see elements of their vision of the state within our system. And we can make this point more broadly. Maybe one of, the, um, one of the secrets of the success of the United Kingdom Constitution is its chameleon-like quality to be different things to different people. For monarchists, we have a queen and the House of Lords and castles and pageantry. For republicans, we have a prime minister who wields the power of the crown and citizenship established as the basic unit of state membership. For federalists, the devolution settlement is on the cusp of becoming a federation. For parliamentary sovereignty lovers and fans of a unitary state, it's Parliament 
that has the final say. For fans of individual rights, we have the Human Rights Act and uh, the Equalities Act. For those who tend towards democracy, making decisions about our rights, Parliament, again, can override the decision of the courts. Um, this, I remember Badshot, all those years ago, wrote the United Kingdom was um, a republic in the guise of a monarchy. Maybe, I think Stephen Steadley wrote that we're a, um, a federation in the guise of a unitary state. This idea of the United Kingdom being multiple things simultaneously is, 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 is powerful and important and is a way of getting people to identify with the Constitution and to acquiesce in its structures. Um, of course, if Jeff's Constitutional Convention were held, all of these would be thrown up in the air. Perhaps the United Kingdom should become a republic. Perhaps devolution should be abandoned. Perhaps the Human Rights Act appealed and strengthened. Um, all of these may or may not be uh, desirable. But on Jeff's model, they would be bundled together into a single document and put to the people in, in, in one vote. We would create a great many losers in this exercise. Many people would see elements of the Constitution stripped away, even if the Constitution did look tidier um, as a, a, a result. Do I have a few seconds? Just one, one, a side point. I was very interested to hear that the government is thinking of creating a fast-track way to correct, in inverted commas, judicial decisions it disliked. And I thought this was hugely unwise. Hugely unwise. And hugely unwise for rule of law concerns and all that, but hugely unwise because the government should welcome it when courts overturn government decisions <laughs> because it means people can identify with state institutions. Even if they don't support the government, they can think, ah, oh, at least the courts are, 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 are on my side. Getting that diversity of different approaches within the Constitution, creating conflict within the Constitution can be a good thing. Well, um, my final paragraph, to conclude, I want to guard against the risk that you think I think the United Kingdom is perfect and nothing should change. I don't. There are plenty of areas of the Constitution that call for reform, but ordinarily this reform should be done piecemeal, not tied up as a package, and we should remember the value of keeping bits of the Constitution that we dislike if they serve to help others identify with that constitutional order. I promised at the start I would give you one instance when I think we might or we should move towards a written constitution. And this is it. The biggest mistake the Labour government made in constitutional terms was the devolution settlement. It was botched. It was botched. We should have moved to a federal state back in around the year 2000. Um, and I think if we want the union to continue, we still need to move towards, we still need to create um, a federal state. If that were to come about, if we were to move to a federal state, we would need to have um, a document that divided power between Westminster and the other territories. We would need to have a constitutional court that could strike down legislation that ran contrary to those uh, rules. We would probably need a second house of parliament that represented the regions. Um, so I think we should move towards a federal state. And if we do, then we might as well admit that we've got a written constitution because that document would be effectively a written constitution. And that is the one situation I can see where there would be value to moving towards a written constitution. Thank you very much. Well, thanks very much, Nick, for a very engaging repost. And uh, thanks to our other panellists too. We're now going to turn to Jeff to give him five minutes or ten minutes, Jeff, as you need to do that. And then we will be turning to you who are here to put various questions either to our panellists or to Jeff. Jeff. Okay. Thank you very much to all three panelists for their, their remarks. Uh, let, me, let me respond to them in the order they were given. So, um, Professor Grayling, thank you for your comments, and I'm delighted that, that we agree on many of the important fundamentals. Your point about clarity being undeniable, uh, I agree with that clarity in a democratic society and in constitutional arrangements is extremely important, and it's important for specifying what rights that we have. My claim was that uh, much of the Constitution as we now have it is reasonably clear. And furthermore, it's not so clear how much more clarity we get from the exercise of codification. Perhaps I'm affected by my, my life as a constitutional lawyer, which is constantly focusing on the ambiguities of constitutional arrangements. 
but there's a strong argument that no greater clarity would be added by the codification exercise. For instance, the Constitution Unit has adopted a report arguing something like that. I think the case is overstated. I think the Brexit experience has shown there were key issues that would not need to have been litigated or debated if we'd had a codified constitution. But then even if there's an additional, a margin of additional um, specificity added, you need to address what what is the cost of purchasing that clarity. If it is used as a ground for adopting a an entrenched constitution which hands a lot more power to the, uh, the judiciary or it reduces democratic input into lawmaking, then that's a, a, an issue that needs to be uh, reckoned with. And that's why I like to see that the clarity arguments and the rights arguments go alongside and together with the democratic case. I'm not suggesting there's nothing to them, but I feel that the, the democratic argument is needed um, uh, for re reasons of legitimacy and to explain just how deeply entrenched it should be, the Constitution should be. So your remarks on flexibility, I also agree with. We can find ways in which we can make the process of changing the Constitution not so easy that it can almost be done accidentally, as it is now the case in the British Constitution, um, but where it isn't deeply uh, counter-majoritarian. And there are lots of examples in Europe that I explore in the, in the piece that give formula that could be used for that for that reason. So um, Chris McCrudden, thank you for your comments. I come from a multinational democracy in Canada and I'm well aware of uh, the importance of, of um, nations, multi, you know, more than one nation in a society. You said that there is a faulty conception of the people in the essay and furthermore there's a faulty conception of sovereignty. Now, in the essay, I explicitly disavow any metaphysical notion of the people in an Ackermanian type of sense. I, I don't think there's any unified conception of people. You rightly identified that my claim is that when I talk about the people, I'm talking about the electors, the citizens, and perhaps on some questions, residents. Would they be given a voice in this exercise? Now, I feel that the, the crux of your comments in that section of your response we're actually asserting that there is a people or two peoples or two communities that should be regarded as peoples in Northern Ireland and in therefore is inviting the kind of very metaphysics that I'm denying in this exercise. You say one of the communities doesn't want to take up uh, citizenship in the state. It is entirely, I suppose, the right of that group of electors not to exercise their vote, not to return candidates to Parliament. Um, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a set of electors which is diverse in Northern Ireland, which does not have some role to play in articulating what the UK constitution is, and to have a voice in how the rest of the United Kingdom responds to constitutional issues arising in Northern Ireland. Repeatedly, you're giving the example that Northern Ireland has almost decided its own constitutional fate through the Belfast Agreement and so on. Well, it so happens that the Northern Ireland Act was the product of, of, a, of a Westminster Parliament becoming heavily involved in trying to settle that persisting dispute in Northern Ireland. The, 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 the government in Westminster is involved in that, in that conflict, in providing for direct rule when that's needed, and it will continue to be involved. The suggestion here is that the arrangements in Northern Ireland could be given a sort of firmer or more constitutional footing through this kind of exercise. Now you say that um, it's inappropriate for voters in England to be deciding how things are running in Northern Ireland, but the, you know, that is already the case. The, there, the influence of the Westminster Parliament is felt there. I don't know if your proposal is to remove it entirely. Uh, I don't know if you think that it, the solution should be entirely done from within Northern Ireland, but uh, I don't see the way forward on, on that. And I don't see the metaphysics of peoplehood um, lending any uh, support to that kind of solution. I think it's false. You have suggested that there's a conception of sovereignty uh, in this paper that you think is a part of the problem. I don't really understand what the argument is, to be honest. Um, it's not that public international law ceases to apply to the state. Um, it's not that whatever 
is said in such an assembly is completely, uh, it's unmoored from political or legal ideas or constitutional ideas. Um, what it is, it, the argument that I've presented details a conception of democracy that should be adhered to in this kind of exercise. And I think that, um, so I don't, I just don't see how the sovereignty conception um, has any real bearing on that. I don't, I don't know if you're suggesting that state sovereignty should be abandoned altogether. I think that's untenable, not from a political point of view, but from a moral point of view. And I'm not saying that international legal principles should have no bearing on it uh, either. As for the Belfast Agreement, I think that unlike what Nick has said, there's no suggestion here, and nor would it be the reality, that anything like the Belfast Agreement would be torn up every generation. I'll come, I'll come to this point when I respond to Nick. The customs and the arrangements that have already been settled in constitutional arrangements will continue to have a large impact on how this constitution is developed. I think that there will be little appetite for abandoning a settlement, the Belfast Agreement, that has led to a very significant change in peace in Northern Ireland. So um, I, I don't know why you'd think that uh, the voters across the United Kingdom as a whole assembled in such an assembly, informed as it would be, would opt for a solution that would recreate the violence that we had during the period of the Troubles. So what I think would happen, I would wager, is that the principles in the Belfast Agreement would be put on constitutional footing and would need to be taken extremely seriously whenever an event such as Brexit rolls around. Lastly, I'm not sure what you think, Chris, does justify a written constitution. Is it respect for rights? Is it that you would write up the constitution and give it to people because you have a, a conception of peoplehood and rights and of international justice, a post-sovereignist post conception? I don't see how that would all fit together, how you would justify that, whether it would be handed down through the clouds um, or whether the people would have any say. And if they would have a say, then there's a lot of explaining to do and just how they're going to have that say and also about how entrenched that document should be. Now, let me come on to um, Nick. So Nick's intervention is characteristically wise, and he was characteristically generous in sending it to me beforehand. So I have a few things I've already prepared. So first, he asks us to recognize the current situation in the UK as an instance of a highly successful democracy. Well, I'd advise people to read the book Failures of State, uh, examining how the UK government, the central government, responded to the COVID-19 crisis, which is uh, an incredibly incompetent way. More broadly, I think most observers familiar with systems abroad would disagree with Nick's assessment, so I don't accept the intuition pump that we should be happy with what we have. And in any event, the situation could clearly be improved. Second, and this is the major issue, and this is the one I've addressed, the, the assumption in, the, in the, your, your reaction, Nick, is that the Constitution would be ripped up every 25 years. That's not the claim, it's not the expectation, and it would never happen. And the Belfast Agreement is a good case in point. The parties to the convention would know that this is the glue that holds things together in Belfast, although it's put to the test very often, not in Belfast, but in all of Northern Ireland. And the mode of deliberation in the convention would make that reality very salient to the discussions. That the communities should reconsider the constitutional status of the Belfast Agreement periodically does not strike me as wild, perhaps Chris will say it is. If it really were wild, though, why would the convention not just agree that it would be wild to revisit that agreement? Would the constitutional negotiations be particularly divisive? The first argument that Nick has presented is, assumes that in some way silence isn't violent, that the status quo is not oppressive in what we already have. Think of the Northern Ireland before the Belfast Agreement, which I regard as a constitutionalist exercise par excellence, and look at the House of Lords before 1998. Secondly, it doesn't acknowledge there are many studies of citizens' assemblies on diverse constitutional matters. This kind of polarization is exactly the problem these assemblies have been shown to be effective at dealing with. Third, the, the claim that in any real convention, this government, through the intermediation of the policy exchange, would dictate the rules doesn't fly. The funny thing, indeed, about this argument is that it assumes that it is not this government 
being instructed by the policy exchange that is currently writing the constitutional rules that we live under. It's suggesting constantly that delegated powers be unaccountable. It's adding provisions to bills that are disapplying provisions of the Human Rights Act. It's cutting back on legal accountability. All of these very subtle moves, which are only noticed by those at the coal face of the legislative process, are being made on the instructions of these people here. And they're allowed to happen because we have a winner-takes-all system in Westminster. These moves would not be permitted under any soundly thought through constitutional arrangements. <coughs> Lastly, I want to just point out the trouble, I think, with Nick's own concession of contemplating a Westminster dictated federal solution that would accidentally give rise to a written constitution. On the thin argument, the government would write the constitution and it would slip all sorts of things into it. And the question of how trenched, entrenched it should be would be put into the background. We need federalism. We let's not talk about human rights or let's not talk about entrenchment. We need federalism. Because people will be led by the headline argument that we just need federalism. This is the problem with one problem at a time, constitutional reform. You need a more thought through process that diminishes the power of that one central faction over the process. So I think that the, the argument that we should just adopt a, a written constitution to achieve federalism in the UK is blind to the problems that would bring with it. Okay, thank you to my um, commentators. I look forward to the discussion. Thanks very much, Jeff, for, for that robust defense. Um, I can see we've already got people who I can't necessarily recognize behind their masks. Thanks very much, Guy. To if, oh, it's Ewan, is it? Sure. Yeah. Um, thank you very much to Jeff and to the whole panel. Um, there's at least two arguments going on here. And one is an argument about whether a written constitution is desirable. And I think it's bound up in the way that Jeff describes this as an exercise repeatedly in his response to the panelists. But there's another argument about whether this is available to us and what the conditions might be for us to achieve this. Um, Kate, if, if um, someone is speaking, we can't hear it. Okay. Sorry, Chris, this is coming through the microphone. Somebody is speaking. Just hang on a sec. We're just going to make sure the microphone comes through. Thanks for raising that, Chris. Uh, you know what, Ewan? I might suggest you come down and speak from here for the moment while they try and sort that out. We're just going to get somebody to speak directly from here. Sorry, Chris. You. Uh, Ewan, you're going to have to just repeat. Great. Um, just to repeat for those who are at home. Um, first of all, thank you very much to the panel. Second, there are two arguments in this discussion. One is an argument about whether a written constitution is desirable, and that's bound up in the idea this is being an exercise. Another is an argument about whether a written constitution is something that is available to us, drawing on what Nick and Chris have said. So I want to pose a question to Jeff about whether he thinks every state can have a written constitution at any time, or whether there are any examples of states that simply couldn't conclude the sort of written constitution he's suggesting. And in particular, there's a section in the middle of the paper where Jeff talks about E.P. Thompson and sets out some of the preconditions for a successful rule of law. It strikes me that there might be some similar political preconditions that you have to satisfy to have the thing that Jeff wants. And that's bound into to one of the responses just finally that Jeff gave to, to Nick. Jeff, I think, came quite close to saying that there might be certain things that are off limits for this constitutional convention. I think that's one way to interpret what you, you said about the, the Good Friday Agreement. Now, one way would be that simply people wouldn't bother to change this. So I'm quite sceptical about that if you, as you did, exclude, for example, the nationalist community in Northern Ireland. I think there's quite a good chance that the Good Friday Agreement would be changed there. Are there any political preconditions that have to be satisfied in order for us to have a written constitution? And would there be any sort of deeper constitution that this convention couldn't change? Thanks. Great, thanks very much. I'm just going to see if there are other questions here. Yes, uh, Errol, I'm not sure. We've got the microphones working. <laughs> We're just going to try the microphone again. Just wave if you can't hear, will you? Don't unmute it. Okay. Right. Jeff, um, as, uh, no, I'm sorry. sorry. Jeff, uh, Errol Mendes, uh, as a fellow Canadian, I'm surprised you haven't adopted a middle approach as Canada did, 
which has both an unwritten constitution in many areas and a written constitution, which includes an entrenched Bill of Rights. Uh, and one of the reasons why I'm surprised you didn't do that, because many experts, myself included, uh, would have thought that a convention, a constitutional convention, would never have happened in Canada because it is too complex, too diverse, etc. And one way in which we managed to get the, the democratic input in this was to have Parliament have uh, cross Canada uh, dialogue on what should be in the Charter and others, and it was very successful. We had, if you like, a democratic process which included all the areas that you mentioned. Um, and given the fact that Canada is also a multinational country, it also included uh, many of the other types of federalism and other issues. Now, obviously, one province did not agree, Quebec, but uh, the majority of MPs did agree, and that actually got us cover. And one reason why I disagree with uh, my friend Nick is because, Nick, uh, in terms of your thought experiment, Canada was listed as the number one country in the world to live in and does have a written constitution. Um, and one reason why I, as, uh, as many experts did at the very outset, fought bitterly to have that uh, entrenched constitution is because in the 1970s, we began to realize that, that Canada, even though it was essentially still um, uh, uh, predominantly a British society, was becoming very heterogeneous, had massive um, equality issues involved in it with immigration, with the indigenous peoples, and if we wanted to protect the nature of the country, they had to be an entrenched document and has proved now to be very successful because uh, in polls across the country, the number one document that Canadians regard as, uh, as valuable is the Charter, not Parliament, the Charter, and secondly, our equivalent of the NHS, but the Charter always comes first. So, so Nick, I'm surprised that you haven't adopted, being a Canadian, that middle approach given the fact that it almost would have been impossible for Canada to have a constitutional convention. Thanks very much. And we'll take one more if there's another question from the audience here. Yes. Um, yeah, hi. Uh, Nick Dickinson, Balliol College. Um, I had a question about the 20-year sort of expiry and um, provisions. I wonder whether that really provides um, enough democratic legitimacy. Um, because if you missed one of those exercises when you were, say, a teenager, couldn't really participate in this referendum, you'd still be in your 30s by the time there was another one. So you'd still have entire generations that wouldn't participate in this process at all. And so doesn't it sort of selectively disenfranchise in some sense to have these periods which are quite long, longer than a general election, um, but not long enough that um, it's a sort of once in a multi-century sort of events as constitution setting sometimes is. Great. Thanks very much. And just to remind those who are watching online, you are able to send questions to us, which we will pick up if you want. Jeff, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you to all for questions. And I wanted to mention to the audience, uh, please don't feel sheepish about putting questions to the commentators uh, instead of just to me. It won't be taken <laughs> the wrong way. And um, yeah, indeed. Uh, so. Um, Ewan, it, there are two separate um, discussions, uh, and I'm concerned with the is it desirable, normatively speaking. Can it happen is a question of real politik. I think there are ways to make it happen, uh, which I won't go into now, but are in the article. Should every state conduct this exercise? Well, I think the answer is really bluntly, is your state ready for a democratic system of government? And if the answer is yes, then yes, I think it should have this kind of exercise. And by democratic system of government, I mean a pluralist, inclusive, rights-respecting system of government. If the answer is, if your answer, to, put, to make this more significant, if your answer is, we'll never do this in my country um, because all hell would break loose, well, then I would say, you're saying that your country is really not ready as a democratic country. And that is something you need to reckon with. Are there political preconditions that um, need to be heeded? I actually, the preconditions, I think, for this argument to run are that the, the way in which the, the convention, the constituent assembly is set up and the extent of entrenchment would need to be respected. One weak point, whether it's an Achilles heel or not, is whether this whole argument puts in train something that can't be stopped, which doesn't meet those preconditions. I'm confident it can, in this country it wouldn't happen because there's no real huge appetite 
for deep entrenchment. But that's not always the case uh, elsewhere. Um, Errol Mendes, pleasure to see you, uh, and not in my home city of, of Ottawa, uh, but here in Oxford. I, I do think that a written constitution would be complemented by an unwritten constitution. So the cabinet manual, for instance, I know is something that the High Commissioner for Canada, who is a former senior civil servant, is keen that Canada should also have. And I, and I, think, uh, I think it was a success. Hannah White might tell me that I'm daft for saying that. So the soft codification of elements of the constitution, conventions and practices and usage, the existence of something like Erskine May's parliamentary practice, that should not go away. Um, why can we not use the Canadian model, which was led by um, Pierre Trudeau's government, liberal government? Uh, and uh, you know, if Trudeau could do it, why can't it be done here and elsewhere? Um, I think, um, first of all, we should recognize that the product of that exercise, the, Can the Canada Act 1982, was largely a Bill of Rights. It wasn't a comprehensive constitution. Secondly, that included within it the notwithstanding clause, which allows the government, the federal government, to enact laws notwithstanding the application of the charter. And so there are counter-majoritarian elements that are built into this thing. Um, but thirdly, it's, it's not clear to me why um, the fact that it is working doesn't mean that we should have a periodic revisitation of that and reaffirmation. And I think that holds true independently of its outcomes. But in Canada right now, as you know, the courts are under threat and there are moves to politicize appointments to the judiciary, even though the Canadian public is actually broadly highly supportive of the Canadian Charter, as is the Prime Minister at the moment. So I think that this type of exercise would probably have the political effect in Canada of reinforcing <coughs> charter values and making the arguments that there's something illegitimate going on uh, in the courts disappear or at least be put into the background. Nick, thank you for your question. Is the generational renewal still not democratic enough? It's a great question. Um, I suppose that um, it's way better than the, the status quo at the moment, that these questions are put on the table to be looked at at least every 20 years in a comprehensive process. They automatically get up to the top of the agenda. What happens in between is essentially similar to what we have now. Unless you think that my suggestion of a constitutional amendment bill passed by both houses followed by a referendum, that the referendum itself is blocking a conception of democracy, which might be your view. Uh, and, and, uh, and that's certainly the idea for referendums that Dicey had when the home rule question uh, came up earlier in the century. Take that, um, uh, Chris McCredden. Um, so I don't see referenda on constitutional questions, major ones, to be uh, unexplainable in terms of democracy or an impediment to it. So I would, I would have to discuss that point separately with you. Uh, thanks, Jeff. I'm just wondering if any of the commentators would like to say anything. Uh, Anthony, Chris, anything you'd like to add in relation to those comments? Sure. We're, we're in your hands, Kate, as to when you want to bring us in. Okay. Um, uh, you, I beg your pardon, you say you wave your hand if I bring you in. Yeah, you want to say something, Chris? Yeah. Sure. Um, um, so, just, just to pick up two, two points, I think. Um, one is... Um, on, on, on the peoplehood notion and, and what, he, what Jeff calls the metaphysics of, of peoplehood. Um, Jeff has a conception of nations in Canada. He has a conception of the nation in the UK. My problem is, I don't know what that is if it's not a metaphysical understanding. Um, it's not that he doesn't have a conception. It's that he hasn't made it problematic. Um, and this becomes particularly important um, when he comes forward with what seemed to me a, a quite a strong assertion that there was a moral justification for national sovereignty. If that's the case, then we need a very strong conception of who the people are. And it's contested. So on the question of, of, of sovereignty, what are the constraints? And, and Jeff doesn't see the problems. Well, it, the consistent question that's coming back time after time is what, if any, preconditions are there in what's being negotiated? 
And is it majoritarian across the UK? So Jeff's response is, I think, there are no substantive constraints. That's sovereignist. There are no substantive constraints either internally in the UK or externally from other sources outside the UK. You don't have to be building an argument that you want to get rid of national sovereignty completely to say that it has to be, in certain cases, subject to external and indeed internal preconditions. So turning to the Good Friday Agreement as an example of this, the idea that, you know, basically we should trust the English voters uh, to get the Good Friday Agreement right. Really? I mean, you don't have to engage in the kind of boosterism um, of, of, of some politicians that everything's going to be fine to be highly skeptical that we should trust English voters, given that they voted for Brexit, given that they supported it again in the most recent general election, given that public opinion consistently shows um, that the great British public would prefer Brexit over anything to do with the Northern Ireland peace process. So give me a break. Thanks, Chris. Yes, Anthony. Um, th this discussion is uh, moving at a number of different levels. <laughs> but, and uh, the um, practicalities of the issue are rightly in focus because of the great complexity in the UK with the component nations and with, in the last quarter of a century and more, the move to devolution. That has complexified the issues very, very considerably. Uh, I think 100 years ago, 150 years ago, when people, budget, for example, was writing at a time when uh, assumptions could be made about uniformities across all the nations of the uh, British Isles uh, that simply cannot be made now. Now, uh, uh, you know, a, a slight problem that I have is this. Um, speaking as, as a, um, a philosopher, the, the interest for me is in the question of whether or not um, there are good grounds for having a constitution, no matter how difficult and complicated it might be to devise one and whatever the consequences might be for a multinational state as it currently stands. But the, the, the lawyers are, are among us naturally leap over the question of principle. Uh, I mean, look, they, they may have very strong views about whether or not there should be a constitution at all. And think about how incredibly difficult it would be to devise one for our current circumstances. And they're right about that. that that's, that's right. But it does seem to me important to clarify two things. One question of principle, should we have a constitution at all? What, serve, what purposes are served by having a constitution? And secondly, are, are, are the practical difficulties about instituting a constitution in a situation like the one we're in so great that they, uh, they, they subvert the, the, the question of principle? Now, in, in um, Jeff's case, the, the, the a fundamental point that Jeff is making is that a constitution, however devised, must nevertheless necessarily be democratically devised. In other words, it must be one which invokes, involves, and applies uh, the input of the, the people, meaning, and I mean here, I, I don't think uh, what one needs to have too far uh, over the question of adult uh, citizens with the vote as being the primary focal sense of it. Of course, what Chris has raised is the, the very good point that the, the people, the, the phrase, the people, uh, becomes ambiguous and, and complex in a situation such as the one that we have at the moment. But of course, in general terms, in, in terms of general principle, the, the, the concept of the people has now matured into one where, for that focal case anyway, the adult uh, voting citizens of the state. I mean, I'm really reminded of the fact that when Lincoln in the famous Gettysburg Address um, defined democracy as government by the people, for the people, <clears throat> uh, government of the people, by the people, for the people, the second occurrence of the word people in that definition meant white men who own property. Um, and the other two occurrences of the word people meant uh, everybody in the state, independently of their party or factional interests, and so on, and and so I mean, Chris is quite right to, to bring this this point up, but it, it doesn't in connection at any rate with the the point of principle about why uh, we should have a constitution at all. I think there is a, a clear enough grasp of of what we mean there uh, to to see the point 
that, that I think Jeff is making about this having not to be a top-down thing, something imposed by whoever is currently in power in Parliament, but should be something which inclusively involves everybody who uh, is entitled to a voice. Uh, thanks, Anthony. I know that there are questions online, but Nick, I just wondered if you wanted to say anything at this stage. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Thank you. Just a couple of uh, very, very quick observations about Professor Grayling, or Professor Grayling just said, <clears throat> about principle and practice. So Professor Grayling um, <clears throat> suggested that um, philosophers would see that as a matter of principle, we should have a written constitution, and it's um, just the killjoy lawyers who then come along with all these objections to show why it would be very difficult and why it would be hard. And I just want to raise a bit of a query over that. I'm not sure that as a matter of principle it's quite as clear-cut as Professor Grayling suggests. So in my presentation, I tried to encourage you to think about what the point of a constitution was. So think about the co a constitution. What's the nature of a constitution? What's its objective? And I suggested to you that Jeff had got one of the things a constitution could do, i.e. express the values of the community, but he hadn't identified the primary purpose of a constitution, which is to create a stable and effective state. Now... If the point of a constitution is to create a stable and effective state that can advance the well-being of its people, does that necessitate, as a matter of principle, that it adopt a written constitution? And I think the answer is no. There isn't an argument of principle drawn from the nature of a constitution to show that it must be written. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have a written constitution. That just means it's an open question. We're not just going down to, 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 to practicalities. Um, if it were the case that we conclude, as I suggest you must, ladies and gentlemen, um, that the United Kingdom Constitution will better serve its purpose at the moment by remaining unwritten, that's a principled argument for keeping an unwritten constitution for the United Kingdom. And by the way, the United Kingdom is, maybe with the exception, I think, of Israel and New Zealand, perhaps one of the tiny number of countries in the world where we have that, got that choice. Most countries don't have that choice, but we have the choice, and it's not an unprincipled conclusion to conclude we don't need a written constitution today. Thanks, thanks, Nick. So, um, Gayatri, would you be able to put the questions from online? Yes, Kate. So I'll read out three of the questions that have come in. Um, the first is from Stefan Thayer, and this is a question for Jeff. Does his proposal require a meta-constitution in the background, one that ensures that the constitution expires and lays out the constitutional convention procedure? If yes, who enforces it? If no, how do you ensure that it will be the procedure that governs the constitutional convention? It would seem to conflict with his concern over elitist capture of the constitution, which his preference for the people to write the constitution seeks to overcome. Um, and the second question is, the adoption of a constitution is often accompanied by tremendous instability. And Jeff seems to suggest that it would depend on whether or not a country is ready for democracy, and that is a fact to be reckoned with. However, how does one determine this? After all, a highly popular constitution could be overthrown by weak institutional arrangement. It seems objectively impossible to assess the robustness of institutions. Apart from a feeble defense, how does this actually work? And the final one is probably for the commentators and not Jeff. Um, Jeff takes democracy as an ideal and to ensure that UK is a democratic state, we need to make a statement by going for a written constitution authorized by the people. Nick Barber's argument, on the other hand, is more pragmatic. It stands on the pragmatism of what will work. But democracy always has its cost. Should we refute the argument for democracy broadly on the apprehension of an unwanted outcome? though we all enjoy the ideal of democracy at the cost of probabilities. Thank you, Stefan, for that question. And thank you very much profoundly for organizing this day so incredibly well. Does the exercise that I foresee require a meta-constitution in the background? Well, it does in the sense that there need to be rules about who is in political power and what counts as valid law. In that sense, every polity will have a constitution. But it doesn't presuppose that there should be a written codified constitution in the background, um, because this is an exercise of bringing just that into uh, place. So 
If the question is, how do the preconditions set out in the argument that I've offered, how can we be sure that they are followed? The answer is that these are, the, these are principles that are being offered. No one can guarantee that any political outcome will be followed in any constitutional exercise. And even if there were a meta-constitution enforced by judiciary, the conventional view of the role of constituent assemblies is that they're not bound by previous constitutions, but they, they constitute freshly. So I think that the, the, the guarantees for the respect for democracy lie in the culture that is in the polity or the set of polities where this exercise, this exercise is carried out. If, if that sounds like very wishy-washy, well, that is exactly the situation that we live in in this country right now. Okay, so what I'm proposing is to move forward from that. The second question, as I understood it, was making the claim that constitutions are adopted after periods of great instability. And I think if I understand the question, it's about how can we be sure that the exercise that I'm suggesting wouldn't be somehow marred by instability or broken up. Um, not all constitutional reform exercise happen during periods of great instability. That wasn't the case with Canada, for instance. It wasn't the case for um, New Zealand and uh, for some reforms or in this country. So it's not a condition that things be unstable or violent or whatever to have a constitution. It's just that after those periods, uh, there tends to be a constitutional reckoning. So I think it's accidental in that, in that sense. Um, I think that having a constitutional renewal process would, it might coincide with periods of instability, it might coincide with periods of stability. But I guess my basic view is that the fact that the constitution is not being revisited is not in any way empirically demonstrated to be coordinated with great periods of instability in some kind of causal way. So I think the two operate largely independent. Constitutional reform is often the solution to periods of political instability, as it was in Northern Ireland, and as it was uh, in many other countries with consociational arrangements. I think the third question was for, oh, I just wanted to say something about what Nick had said very briefly. A favorite quote of mine was about Gerald Ford, President Ford, they said he was so dumb he couldn't walk and chew gum at the same time. I don't think that constitutions only have to have one purpose. I think that an assembly can, can work out multiple purposes for constitutions. Elaborating mission statements is one, and, and ensuring peace and stability can be another. And there are, there are many others, like fortifying democracy. OK. Well, thank you for that question about um, uh, democracy which I think raises a number of interesting um, issues. And I think um, the first issue it raises actually is what do we understand by democracy in uh, the modern state? Um, and I think that in the background, many of us have what is um, a romanticized and impossible vision of what it means to have democracy. <clears throat> There's this idea that the people as a whole get to speak on every single issue. So democracy is reduced to some sort of direct and total uh, 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 democracy, but we all know that um, if we did create structures that permitted direct democracy and every state decision to be made by the people as a whole, we would last maybe a day or two before the whole system collapsed into anarchy, chaos, and something that you put on Netflix over uh, uh, eight or nine weeks. Um, so I would suggest to you that a better understanding of democracy would recognise that all state decisions and all state rules should be reviewable by democratic processes by elected bodies, but wouldn't require that all decisions have been made by the people directly. So it wouldn't require, for example, that all decisions of courts are made by the people. It wouldn't necessarily require, I think, that all um, executive decisions are made by the people, or all that the conventions in the Constitution can be traced back to the people in some way. What matters is that we've got um, democratic structures that enable people to exercise oversight and review of these rules, not necessarily that they have made those rules themselves. And this, interestingly, I think is a point at which Jeff and I do have um, quite a strong disagreement. Jeff, I hope you don't mind me raising this, but Jeff gave me the example of a country whose constitution had been um, written by another country. And he said, well, Nick, if that constitution was working fantastically well, if everybody in that country was happy and prosperous 
and um, it was looked on as a model of, 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 of constitutionalism, would you think that they should stick with that constitution? Surely, Jeff says, they should draw up their own new constitution. I disagree. What matters in that country is that the democratic processes could revise the constitution if they wished, could change those rules if they wished. They don't necessarily have to rip it up and start afresh to counter democracy. So I thought it was a really interesting question. Thank you. But the really difficult part of that is, what does it mean to say that a country is indeed democratic? And I don't think it's the same thing we sort of implicitly assume when we use that phrase. Thanks, Nick. Uh, any other questions that are in the room? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Anthony, yes, go ahead. Sorry, just very quickly. Um, in a democracy, well, I, I suppose uh, the question about whether a, a political order is democratic and the question of whether or not one should have a constitution for it are two separate questions. And the first question is one which is answered uh, much, much more clearly by thinking about the electoral system, about the system of representation, and whether the um, diversity of preferences and interests and desires in the um, electorate is, is properly, properly reflected in the legislature that results from an election. So that, that's, you know, whether or not you have a written constitution, you do have to have an electoral system which is genuinely representative. We emphatically don't have one in the United Kingdom um, for, for the House of Commons. The, 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 the question of, of um, uh, the, the, the Constitution, however, is this, that in a democracy, all power and all authority is delegated. So we delegate to our representatives who go to Parliament with plenipotentiary powers to make laws on our behalf. And the absolute essence of constitutionality must be specification of the limits on those powers. They must specify the duties of office holders in any branch of government and the limits on the powers. But at the moment, we have a, a you know, putatively sovereign uh, parliament or House of Commons, and no constraint whatever on the uh, wishes of whoever happens to have a majority of seats in the House of Commons, whether or not on the minority of votes. And this, this actually is a, uh, a, 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 a point of principle of the very, very first importance. Identifying and uh, uh, settling the limits of the exercise of power of office holders in government is crucial, and that is what a constitution is for. And singularly, the constitution of the United Kingdom, as it stands at present, fails to do that. Thank you very much, Anthony. And I think that actually has brought us to our tea break time. So I'm going to just, just leaves me to thank uh, our panellists in this first session for their very spirited and engaged uh, discussion of, of Jeff's work, and I would be grateful if you'd all join me in thanking them. So we're going to take a 20-minute break, and then we will reconvene for the second panel. For, so for those of you online, it'll, just be, it'll be 20 minutes. We'll come back at five past four UK time. Thanks very much indeed. <laughs>